Who's this? How fast does he go? <laughs> it's the fastest man on earth, 24 miles per hour. Do you know who this is? James Bornhope, our intern. <laughs> He's faster. How do I know? My cell phone tells me that. Why does that happen? Because when we write a app that uses sensors right now, we read two sensors, wait five seconds, compute the speed, and we get trash. All right? And the reason we get trash is because occasionally the, the GPS sensor is uh, down. Occasionally, your government will make the sensors bad on purpose. Uh, sometimes uh, a, a building is occluding one of the sensors, and you need all the satellites to be communicating with the phone, at least four or five, to get really accurate readings. And so the quality of the sensor reading that you get at any time is varies a lot. All right, and so this is an example of James walking around the Microsoft campus and the different amounts of error that each of these sensors readings gave us. And that's a problem for using sensors that give you estimates and other kinds of applications. For example, machine learning is also giving you an estimate. So how your reasoning and, and image understanding and all sorts of of uh, applications we're using today aren't giving us perfect answers, yet we don't have the tools to interpret those answers. We don't have the programming models, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So we've got a basic programming model called uncertainty. And then I'm going to motivate that once you have an estimate, it's usually not good enough. You need to add some domain knowledge to get it to be correct. And then you have a bunch of programs that aren't producing the same answer every time and not, aren't producing perfect answers. And what the heck do those programs mean? And so I'm going to talk about these three things today. All right, so let's go back to our simple example. And that's the original program. So we want to make programming with estimates just as easy as doing this, but we want to make it a lot more accurate. So in this case, all we're doing for adding a type is, is calling it an uncertain type. The programmer still gets to use it as if it's an integer or a geo-coordinate in this case, so that the programming model is still very intuitive and simple, so lots of people can use it, hopefully. Mostly computer scientists, but maybe not. And then instead of speed greater than four being a conditional, it's now a hypothesis test. And the, what it's saying is, is it more likely than not if speed is greater than four? All right, so how do we evaluate that? Well, the punchline is just doing that gives, gets rid of a lot of garbage, but not all the garbage, all right? So we have a semantics that gives you computing over random variables, although the developer is still computing over uh, the base type. And then we're evaluating those conditionals with a hypothesis test. And we embed the statistics into your programming language. So before, in your compiler class or your programming class, you saw data flow semantics for your program. Now we have statistical semantics baked into the runtime. How does that work? All right, so let's say we have two Gaussians that we're adding together. And so we're representing those distributions by random samples. So the basic data, for example, that comes from the GPS has to give us an error model. So we're still relying on some expertise. The GPS programmers, they have models of error for, for when you see that little dot on your phone, you're actually least likely to be there. The GPS error is, looks like a donut. It's a Rowley distribution. So you're actually likely to be in a little circle around where that dot is, all right? So each data provider that's producing an estimate or someone who experimentally evaluates it has to develop an error model about the data. So there is some expertise required, but not on the consumer of the estimate, but on the provider of the estimate. All right, 
So now when you add those two things together, you get another distribution, and you can see the error got wider. And that's another problem. Once you start computing with an estimate and adding it together, adding more stuff to it, you get increases in errors. And that's why we got uh, eight James uh, walking at 89 miles per hour. All right, so when the program you write down D equals A plus B, instead of evaluating that immediately, the runtime builds a Bayesian network, all right? And then once you get to a conditional, that's when the network evaluates that Bayesian, or that's when the programming language implementation evaluates the expressions that you build up, okay? And the reason for that is only when you see that conditional do you need to know how precise this computation needs to be. So in traditional programming, uh, probabilistic programming languages that aren't widely used right now, what happens is you pretend it needs to be incredibly accurate, but it depends on how you're using that value. And so we use that to improve our, the efficiency of our runtime. So for example, if we go back to our simple computation is speed greater than four, keep it up, all we have to do is take a few samples that say in this probability distribution, it's very likely you're grading, going greater than four miles per hour, so we're gonna give you kudos, keep running, and we're not gonna say anything to you if you stop to get water. All right, and that's the probability of the speed greater than four. And now, we also let you control false positives and false negatives. So if you want to be very confident Going greater than four, you can increase the, 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 you can specify that in the conditional. So this gives you the power to say, I don't care if I have false positives or negatives, so I can have very low confidence, or I can say, I want to be really sure if I'm, uh, if I'm going to um, give out money, for example, that it's highly probable that somebody did what they said they did, what we're going to do. All right. So this lets you, if we go back to our example, in our naive implementation, we had 30 false positives for a data set of uh, uh, several hundred points. And then just by putting the uncertainty type system in there and having a probability of greater than 50, that brought us down to four false positives. And then if we wanted to be highly confident in this simple example, we uh, can increase the confidence to 90% and, whoops, and my animations didn't work perfectly here. And we get no, no false positives in this simple example. All right, so now let's think about once you have a GPS reading or a machine learning uh, result, for example, a list of, of search results from Bing or a, uh, or a speech recognition of a phrase, you do something with it. And usually what you do is you add context. And so I'm going to talk about context for GPS because I hopefully I've built up a little intuition for you all about GPS. So GPS is used in all sorts of settings right now. So on the band, we can do fitness tracking. How long have you been running? Did you go uphill? What was your heart rate? We have pressure. So the GPS reading can tell us how fast you're going, uh, and or I can use GPS in, in um, a navigation system. And then you're probably in a car, especially that, that, that GPS is definitely in a car because it's attached to the dashboard. So you're most likely on a road. Or if you have a GPS uh, reading that for Austin, nearby Austin restaurants, you're gonna use the context of where you are in very different ways. And so right now, most applications, once they get an estimate from somewhere, they add information to it, they combine sensors. So for example, when we're doing fitness applications on the band, we combine pressure, which is your heart rate, is, is, a, is on a sensor, and we can combine acceleration, altitude, and distance that you go. And that's how we compute how fast you're going, all right? So 
in order to use most estimates and machine learning, you're adding context. All right, so what do you do when you add context? Well, it's a Bayesian uh, reasoning. You want to say, here's my GPS, that green line. So that's my GPS likelihood that I get from it. And then I've got that red road that says where the road is. And then I'm going to put it together. I want to say that uh, most likely I'm on a road. And we call this road snapping. And right now, you can write this code. But if you've uh, looked at the GPS code, it's a mess because there's no programming language help to you. There's no inference that people are using. It's a bunch of ad hoc heuristics and it's a mess. So in our programming language, we add two simple Bayesian constructs, one that lets you build up probability distributions. So for example, saying you're highly likely on a row, 99%. And then, com then we have composition with the Bayesian inference and we use pound and we're still, we're we're not as good as Chris. You can't go download this code today, but we're working through the open source stuff at Microsoft, and hopefully you'll be able to download it soon. If you have better suggestions for syntax, I'm happy to take them. All right, and then, whoops, and I missed one point. So, so now our implementation, because it has more Bayesian logic in it, it has to do higher order inference. And, but we've restricted the programming model quite a bit. And by restricting the programming model, we make it easier for many developers to use. But we also get a big advantage in terms of what statistics we implement in the runtime. And so we have a new algorithm called sequential likelihood reweighting that lets us have an efficient runtime. And I'd be happy to talk about that more later. So now in this case, you can write essentially in two slides of code, and I'm just showing you one of the slides, uh, something that samples from the nearby roads. And then you can say, my new location is my GPS likelihood smashed together with my road prior, and now that pops me back on the road. So for our data, we, uh, we show the original blue dots, which is uh, uh, on a bus near, or actually on the road. And in two lines of code, we've mostly gotten you on the road because the GPS evidence was very strong. We didn't always have you on the road. Now, depending on how you want to program this application, you can weight the road evidence more highly or not. Depends on the application. But what used to take thousands of lines of code now takes two. And that's the point of what we're talking about today. All right, now, what's it mean that we have all these programs that aren't, aren't precise? So in a precise program, you might say, I'm going to assert that this file is not null. And on every execution, it better not be null. And you're good to go. And you can prove a lot of things. There's a lot of programming language theorists, including some here today, that can tell you how to prove this. All right, and you test, verify, and check at runtime. Now, we don't have that anymore. In, a, in, for example, approximate computing, we're going to degrade results on purpose. In, uh, in these estimates, we don't have perfectly accurate. Um, mostly on the road is all we can say. And in another uh, realm, which I like to dabble a little bit, in privacy, we, uh, we want to obfuscate data so that we uh, can say, for example, that, that all of you give the salary information and we can compute an average salary, but I can't tell what any one of your salaries is uh, based on this average. And there's, uh, but we can't, can we prove our implementations actually do this? Well, now we have a, uh, traditional assertions can't do that. And so we have a new way to do this with a probabilistic assert assertion. Trying to speed up here. And so instead of saying assert E, we're going to have a probabilistic assertion with uh, probability P, how strong you want it to be. And, uh, and Rich, I love you. You just keep nodding. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I'm making you happy. And then we have good confidence, all right? 
I tell my students, always look at the happy person who's naughty. <laughs> <laughs> and so now we can say, now this isn't exactly what you want to prove about a probabilistic program, okay, uh, for privacy. This says that the average is close to the real average. But we also want to prove that your data wasn't revealed by computing the average, all right? And so we've, come, we've taken a, some good steps in this direction, but we haven't done the very hardest step, which is to prove in the implementation of differential privacy that you actually get it. So I'd be happy to collaborate with people on that. So what, we've tr what I've done today, hopefully, is used a simple example to motivate a general area that all of us in this room have to deal with because data is just not good all the time, and it varies a lot as to how good it is today versus how good it is tomorrow, and how you reason about that in programs really matters, how we make decisions in crisis. If we have a bunch of bad data versus a bunch of good data, it should matter, and we should have programming language support that does that. And we're gonna see more and more of this with estimates coming from things like farms, from, uh, for example, the, the, the applications that Chris described earlier, those models have errors in them. Are the models reasoning about how good or bad they think the data is? Is this a trustworthy journal versus is this somebody's blog that just made, made something up for the, the day as we saw in the presidential debates recently? So thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs>